slides up? Yeah. Okay. But so this was the, uh, we, we went through the introductions here. This is a, uh, uh, this is the introduction screen. So, but uh, usually we let Sean start off with some history. He's, he's really good at this. So go ahead. Well, I appreciate you setting the bar high there, Jay, <laughs> uh, especially given my technical difficulties and having to dial in here on my phone. But uh, mm -hmm. speaking of which, I think we just lost the presentation. Oops, hold on. I think we're reading your email now, Jay. <laughs> oh, don't read my email. <laughs> so uh, in order to kind of understand where we are and where we're going, it's really important for us to, to usually try to set some context, particularly for those that aren't from Pittsburgh. And, and even those from Pittsburgh don't know a lot of this, uh, this history a lot of times. But Pittsburgh was established in 1876. Uh, and, it was, uh, and then it grew into a mining community, was essentially uh, the economic focus and lifeblood. And it became a, a real hot spot, frankly, for diversity within Kansas, because it was a spot for uh, the, the destination of a lot of uh, immigration from Western and Eastern Europe. You know, I often talk about how I know that I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for my great grandfather making the decision at 21 years old to step on a boat and come over to dig sewers in Boston and then make his way to the, what streets were paved with coal instead of gold uh, here in Weir, Kansas. And uh, that's, that's how my family got here. And that story is repeated over and over again and the people who live here today. So that immigrant heritage is really important to our identity. It really is something that we believe still that sort of striving entrepreneurial spirit of the immigrant really does animate this place. And we, we hope that Block 22 and Idea Shop really are an example of that. Um, from the beginning of collaborative spirit, in fact, the first four buildings in, in history of Pittsburgh, the first four commercial buildings are the four buildings, uh, one of which I'm sitting in now here at Block 22 that we restored as part of uh, during this effort. And so those four buildings uh, starting with a, 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 a hotel and then a, and a dry goods store. And then as the community was growing, even back then, they understood the importance of not only partnership, but of the arts. And so the business community was going to the city saying, we need a sewer system. We need, if we're going to really be the kind of uh, growing uh, metropolis that we could be, we need a, a, a state-of-the-art sewer system. So they said, we'll do that if the business community will build an opera house so that we can have an arts outlet for this growing, particularly um, immigrant population. And so uh, right here at the corner of 4th and Broadway, they built an opera house that also was a bank. So it was even back then being multi-purpose and multi-use. And so uh, that was the third building of the four. And then the fourth building uh, was finished in 1906 and it's called the Commerce Building. And it was where all of the uh, mining executives as well as the union leadership all resided in, in that building. Later on, it evolved into as the mining, as mining uh, started to close up shop and leave, which of course uh, left a lot of uh, economic destruction in its wake as it pulled out, uh, there was a shift toward that building being occupied by professional services. So accountants and lawyers and doctors and dentists and chiropractors and all of those things. And so uh, that was the case for, for many generations. And then in fact, uh, for four plus generations, there was a drugstore on the, on the first floor of that building, which was called Kroll's uh, for the Kroll family. And uh, that most people, when they think of that building, if they're within the last 50 years, had any recollection of this place, they would think of, oh, well, that's where Kroll's is. And so um, that or early focus on collaboration and partnership and on that immigrant spirit of entrepreneurship that really animated this place, we believe still goes to today. And that leadership example from, from that time has very, been very important to us as well. Jay, next slide, please. Uh, Jay, are we, I'm talking about this, right? Yeah, well, I, I think, think so. so. We, we, I think you were. We, we can were bounce planning. off each other, sure. Yeah. So, a lot of anytime someone asks me how did Block 22 happen, and then obviously, then even therefore the idea shop happen, I really a lot of times will go back to uh, almost 10 years ago to the Plaster Center, and it seems a strange connection, but it really was the thing that forged the strong partnership. The university and the community have always had a strong partnership, but. Frankly, we had gone through a period of time where, and I think there was some mutual neglect. The university, I'll, I'll, I'll say, uh, I wasn't here, so I can't take responsibility for it. And my boss, uh, President Scott, who really ch charted the course of the vision of this new uh, revival of that relationship and setting a new model for the university and community relationship. But there had been some years prior to that where it had gotten, it had gotten quite sour. And, um, and then uh, Darren Hall uh, came as city manager and, and he was on the ground for about two days before I went and asked him for $7 million to help us build an indoor event facility that would be an indoor track and field, but then also could be used for conventions and those sorts of things. 
And we set on uh, about, although we never went to a public vote on it, we treated it as if it was a referendum and we worked for the next six to eight months. And along the way, Jay Byers was hired and came on uh, to, the, to the city side team. And we worked through it and we, we eventually got a, a five zero vote for a $5 million investment from the city of Pittsburgh, which in a place in you know Southeast Kansas, it's a population of 20,000 in an area of the state, which is known as the most impoverished of the state for us to get a $5 million investment showed a lot of trust, uh, but also that we had forged a really strong relationship through that six months or so of working through that. And uh, during that period, we had a mutual commitment that we wanted to be the best university city in the country. And we wanted to be a model and, and realize that we were not big enough to be able to just go it alone. So we need to work together. And so along the way, play in this, this, this area chamber of commerce to represent the business community and those kind of three legs of the, the stool of growth and opportunity kind of is shown through these partnerships. So Plaster Center, and then we, we launched a joint city university advisory board that's made up of key uh, leaders from the university side and the city side that started with Jay and I, uh, and actually it actually you could say it started with uh, the IT folks because it was Jay and Angela and their counterparts in the city that had started to meet together for these um, chief information officer meetings, IT meetings. And we kind of then had this idea of what if we could take a similar concept and we match up, you know, the the like leaders on each side and we have start having uh, each semester a, a luncheon. And then that grew into what if we formalize this through a joint city university advisory board that uh, although during the pandemic that evolved somewhat and prior to that it was meeting every other month and a way for us to do shared planning and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I mentioned this uh, the Chamber of Commerce. We've taken a very innovative approach and unique approach that we don't know of anywhere else in the country that's doing this, but we're in the university. The city is contracting directly with the university to support economic uh, development activities, as well as with the Chamber of Commerce. And so we have a three-way economic development contract. And so that's our economic development team. We don't have a single economic development director for the city of Pittsburgh. We have this team approach between the university, the chamber, and the city. And, and it's, worked, it's worked very well. And in fact, in the last seven years, we've had over half a billion dollars in capital investments in the community, 2,000 jobs grown uh, increase in, in the middle class and wages and on and on almost every indicator is, is solid in, in fact in the last uh, while a lot of communities were struggling so much last year because of the pandemic our sales tax revenues were up over 12 percent for 2019 or 2020 over 2019 which we think really shows the strength of the foundation the foundational strength of the economy we're building here um, uh, imagine Pittsburgh 2030 originally now it's imagine Pittsburgh that's a strategy uh, a community-wide strategy planning uh, that we've launched uh, together and now having key stakeholders on that that are helping to form the sort of the master plan for the city of Pittsburgh. And that's been a very successful effort. The, these are some examples of this being the right time for these kind of projects throughout the state, but then beyond. And that one example of that is with Kansas Board of Regents, Pillar 3, Strategic Plan Pillar 3, Economic Prosperity Pillar. Now the focus for the universities to have a intentional interaction and engagement in their economies, as opposed to that secondary or tertiary kinds of things in the past we might have talked about. Um, we have a, an, an emerging R&D capacity, particularly in our polymer space. It's something that uh, I'm pleased to be able to also lead here at the institution with regard to our uh, technology transfer and innovation efforts and research, particularly in polymers and polymeric application. And then uh, finally, uh, as an outgrowth, really of the Joint City University Advisory Board, we launched last, let's see, Jay, was that, it was in April, I believe, of last year, we launched very early on in the pandemic with a recognition of an app, you know, the sense of a gap of uh, a vacuum of leadership, uh, of coordinated leadership, that we would launch this organization and be countywide and have all the key stakeholders from the from the public health to the healthcare, to the business community, to all of the local municipalities within Crawford County, all the municipalities municipalities within Crawford County, the Crawford County government, et cetera, university, on and on, and uh, to be a, a task force that could help us to thread that needle between everybody staying in their basements and the economy being destroyed, or on the other hand, just letting everything loose and the, uh, in addition to the death and destruction, also the impact on the healthcare system. And we, we feel as if uh, this was a very important thing as we move through. So I think you're seeing now that we've really tried to embed within the DNA of this place and tap into some of the things that were from the very beginning, uh, that sort of notions of shared, shared destiny and common good and, and common economic prosperity. All of these are uh, just really building blocks. We, we started with some basic projects that we could, were able to work together on for our mutual benefit and really develop the relationships over the years that, that 
that uh, it, it's very simple for anybody at the university to call anybody at the city and say, hey, we're doing this, you know, can you can you do this for us? And we always work out uh, agreements or arrangements. It's a it's an ongoing relationship. I think Sean, Sean always describes it well as uh, we're going to treat it more like a marriage, not like we're roommates. And that, I think that's a really good way of looking at it. And, uh, and a marriage we can't get out of, too. Well, yeah, that's a good point. We're not, the city's not obviously not going anywhere. I'm pretty sure Pittsburgh, PSU's not going to leave Pittsburgh. So we're, we're, here, we're in it together. Um, just uh, how, the, how Block 22 came about, that, this is kind of my slide. By the way, the, the, the graphic behind you is the original plat layout for the city of Pittsburgh. Back in the day when they did this, they laid it out in grids. Um, the reason why this is called, the thing is called Block 22 is because if you, if you notice on the grid there, the, the, these buildings are located in Block 22 of that original housing or the original grid that was done to lay out the city. Um, we, it came about uh, where we had, the city was working with a low-income housing uh, developer and, um, and that person was driving around with our housing director downtown and, and pointed to a couple of our larger abandoned buildings and said, what's going on with those? And she said, well, nothing. And, uh, and we're really looking forward to, we're look, really strongly looking for someone to redevelop those, those buildings, but we, we just haven't had any luck. And, um, and, and she said, well, I've got, we got, my company has a, has a division that does this kind of thing. And, um, and she said, I'll bring it back to them and see if they're interested. Well, it turns out that the person in charge of that division for that particular development company was a PSU graduate. And that, that, that connection made a, it made a real, was a real important to the, to the whole functioning of, of the relationship we still have with, with that developer today. Um, so that person was able to, um, to come back and, and, and he said, well, we, the numbers don't work if we just do one building. What about these other buildings that were also vacant? And, and, and we said, well, we don't own them, uh, but we can talk to people about it. And so we set about working with them to acquire all of those buildings. We ended up acquiring four buildings. Um, the, um, uh, the, 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 so bundling the buildings was a big deal. With, with, with the four buildings together, the numbers would actually work. And by the way, the developer would be the first one to tell you that you don't, you don't do this to make money. I mean, <laughs> if your goal is to make money, you could develop a lot of other things. These are hard, these are hard projects and they're not, they're not as profitable as greenfield developments or other, anything like that. But, uh, but, but they are willing to do it. It was, a, it was something that the developer was interested in, the company was interested in, and of course, the PSU graduate who was their lead was also interested in it. One of the main things that, that the developer will also tell you is that it was very important that the city made its, its commitment firsthand. So we, we, uh, we committed to 10% of the overall project cost up front, and the city has uh, committed its, its funds first. Being the first money in actually was allowed other money to be attracted to the project. It was, it was kind of a crucial thing. But the real key, the real key was to get an anchor tenant, and the, an anchor tenant of, 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 of some quality, uh, and, the, and PSU uh, was approached. And um, and they agreed to, to to be the anchor tenant for the for the development, and that really uh, gave the the investors a, a certain level of confidence. So um, so in fact, um, this went so this this from the very first time we even talked about putting those four buildings together into a development uh, to the to the time we actually moved the uh, students in. By the way, I helped. It was in August. It was hot. Um, we, uh, we, it was less than three years. And that is, by the way, that is lightning fast for developments of this kind, particularly when we're talking about a funding stack that involved low income housing tax credits, new market tax credits, everything like that. So, so that was the, uh, that was what, uh, that was how this came about. Um, and, and, uh, and it was a, uh, it was certainly a group effort all, all along the way. Um, do you, I don't know, do you want to talk about yeah, what I, point two is, Sean? And I've, I've hit on some of this uh, earlier in the sense of the historical aspect of the first four buildings. Um, and Jay's given a little bit more of a context setting with regard to where things were just five years ago and the challenges that we were, we were facing there were seven years ago, I guess. And uh, so as we uh, listened to the pitch from Matt Burton from the Vecino Group, which was the developer, and uh, he had graduated from high school and college here, as Matt uh, alluded to. And so therefore, he took to this something more than just looking at the bottom line of a balance sheet. And so most developers would have been passing over this. He was, he was seeing this as a way for him to give back to the place that had helped make him. And, uh, and he has very much done that as he's, he's worked side by side with us through this, all of this. And in fact, he's still here as he's actually helping to run one of the restaurants now uh, at the moment. But, um, and, uh, and that's the only way this would have happened. So it was this very unique approach. And so as, 
we looked into this initially the thinking was we would just do housing on, this, on the student housing in the first the upper three floors of each building and then on the first floors we would do mixed use commercial and then as we started to dream a little bit more about that and and this is a place where in the strategic serendipity that I talk a lot about that this sort of notion of everything aligning at the right time and being able to act on it is that Matt Burton, in addition to being a developer, he actually had just pre about six months prior to that left uh, SIFE in Actus, or uh, organization focused on student inter uh, free enterprise entrepreneurship. And so he had spent a lot of time on college campuses looking at that. That was a passion of mine as well. This sense of giving uh, students an opportunity and the community members an opportunity toward access to entrepreneurial support system that uh, they could, we could build that next generation of great uh, Pittsburgh businesses. And so as we started dreaming about that, it was in addition to putting restaurants in, in the first floors because we wanted to have that to help enliven downtown, uh, a coffee shop, of course, but we wanted uh, a space that we now call the Foundry, which is 18,000 square feet of two of the, the buildings um, that on the first floor we're in, it's focused on an on building an entrepreneurial ecosystem. And so it's a combination of uh, entrepreneur and business support services. Uh, in addition, we now have, uh, I think we have 15 tenants now between, uh, we have one, two, one, three, three restaurants, a student-based entrepreneurial uh, retail space. And then we have the coffee shop. And then in addition to that, uh, 11, 12 uh, office tenants. And so in fact, the offices, the co-working office spaces have filled up so fast that we've had to actually a, lot, a number of my team members, three of them have given up their offices so that we could rent them out to local startups and or existing businesses that wanted space here. And so we now have everything that our core uh, sort of cornerstone foundational tenants were, were initially two companies they are now one, but a software development company that was called, uh, De called Dev Squared and then an advertising and marketing company called Limelight. Uh, those two companies uh, actually were occupying a shared space in the building. Uh, they did a, a lot of work together already. They then in increased the amount of work they did together. And then in January, they actually merged into one company. And uh, actually, I think I saw John Kiefler pop up on here that he's in the session. And so John, who's a principal from Dev Squared uh, and now uh, the part of Limelight, that's a great success story, we think. And, and we've been so pleased to share this space with them. And having a software development company and a advertising marketing agency were two of the things that we knew we needed to have. And so otherwise we've got insurance company we now have a, a lawyer uh, who is officing, uh, he's a partner in a firm, but uh, Kansas City, I think, but offices here. And then uh, offices for the field office for uh, Congressman Jake Turner, and then the field office for now uh, Senator Marshall also here. So that's all this very uh, conducive, supportive environment for uh, whether that's grant funding or you're looking for the business support services that we have here, but that's all, that's all here. And so it's been a very, very big impact. I, I did want to talk briefly. Everyone also asked me how we got it funded, and I, I just want to talk briefly about that. Uh, the city's contribution was about two million dollars. Um, the university fundraised about a million. We had state and federal historic tax credits. Uh, there were also new market tax credits, which I think at that point it was the uh, it was the only uh, new market tax credit project uh, outside of a metro area in the state. Uh, and then uh, and then that allowed it to uh, them to get a loan. Of, of uh, about 5.5 million for the total project costs around eight and a half, 18 and a half million. The, uh, the, the really the leveraged loan amount really is important because that loan to loan to uh, project ratio uh, was 30%. At that point, that's a that's a very if, if you're familiar with this kind of financing in any way, that's a very favorable uh, loan to project cost ratio, and it was very easy for them to get the loan uh, with that percentage when the rest of it was paid for through other funds. So anyway, I just wanted to really quickly quickly talk about that, uh, the, uh, the, the funding stack. And, and I can certainly talk about that some more, <laughs> a lot. It's not easy to do any of these things. It was, it took a long time to put the funding stack together. You wanna head, go ahead, Matt. Actually, real quick before Matt goes, I wanna just introduce this uh, quickly. So, you know, we talked about the notion of the importance of these partnerships as we were developing out the concept of the foundry and it was building this entrepreneurial ecosystem that could have support, you know, business support services and, and the right kind of mix of businesses that would be located here and from, you know, stage zero on up. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to also incorporate was a, you know, variously thought of hacker maker space, these sorts of things, but a space wherein people could take that back as a napkin thing and they could go in and, and get a prototype or explore, you know, the, the way to do the, some physical manifestation of that. And so um, we actually now uh, 
we knew we needed to partner with someone who had expertise in this area. And uh, that was uh, pretty quickly realized that's Pitsco Education and uh, their founder, Harvey Dean, being a, a big supporter, a former uh, employee actually. Uh, and he uh, was very supportive of it. And so we went into this with a, not just getting a naming rights for a philanthropic gift. This was, we wanna go in this with a, a partnership approach. And so uh, that's how this all happened. And then very early on, Matt and his team, as he can talk about, helped to help to really shape what we were going to put in there and then what the focus was going to be. And in some ways really helped to shift us away from thinking just in terms of university students or community, but actually now to the focus on our, our real primary first customer focus being sixth through 12th grade and then K through 12 to try to really encourage that access to innovation. So Matt. Yeah, thanks, Sean. And so as, as Sean mentioned, you know, early on, we were really targeting this to, to look like other maker spaces across not only Kansas, but across the country with the idea of it focusing on the community, you know, the university students and then adults in the community. But we realized that, you know, we, we really need to play off of the power of who we are as partners. And as Sean mentioned, you know, Pitsco Education, our focus is K-12 education. We develop hands-on curriculum in the areas of STEM, so science, technology, engineering, and math, with a strong career awareness and career exposure focus. And so we, we quickly shifted our thinking away from it being primarily focused at the community level in terms of adults and saying, okay, what would benefit PSU? Well, creating a recruiting pipeline of students who were engaged at the Pitsco Idea Shop in middle school and high school, they could become more aware of the offerings at Pittsburgh State and would be more likely to say, you know what, I wanna stay right here in my own backyard to go to college and have an experience. And it all started because of ideas that generated at the Pitsco Idea Shop. And so that's how the mission evolved uh, from our early discussions. And so, as you see in the picture in the upper right-hand uh, corner here, this is uh, one of the two spaces that we have. Uh, this is called the garage. And so the garage area, as you can imagine by the name of it, is where the dirty activities occur. So we have all sorts of different uh, table saws and belt sanders and uh, CNC routers. And that, that type of equipment is based in the garage. And so what you see in this particular picture, though, is actually one of Pitsco's hallmark products, which is our 80 foot long CO2 dragster track. And so the very first event that we held um, back in November when we did the grand opening was that we decided to have students build their own CO2 dragster. And so I'll come back to that here in just a second. But in terms of the garage, the other space is, would be the clean space, which is the du digital studio. And so these are adjacent rooms uh, closed off obviously by walls and whatnot for filtration purposes. But in the clean space in the digital studio, you have CAD software, you have 3D printing, you have large format printing, all sorts of, you have a cricket that can be used, uh, all sorts of different design capabilities there. And so it's really the perfect blend of being able to come in and get your hands dirty and, and work in the garage or you can come in and do your design work over in the digital studio. And it, it really fits perfectly with our mantra at Pitsco in terms of hands-on education. We feel like that's the piece that so many students miss out on is to be able to actively engage their hands to then actively engage their minds in the process. So we, we were starting to get the garage in place, get the digital studio in place. We were discussing, you know, what would a membership process look like? You know, how much would families look to invest to be able to send their students like going to the Y, having a Y membership? We talked through that process. And right in the middle of those conversations, COVID hit, and we realized, okay, selling memberships and having groups of people inside an indoor facility isn't going to work very well. And so we quickly uh, pivoted, which I think was a key word for most of us in 2020, everybody had to pivot. And we decided what we're going to do instead are going to create specific student competitions where we could limit the number of students who come in they would be very specifically scheduled in so that we could make sure social distancing was occurring. And so through that, we came up with the idea of the first event being the dragster event that I was speaking of. And so, as I mentioned, Pitsco is a 50 year company. One of our very first products were balsa blank CO2 dragsters. 
And in essence, what you have is an eight to 12 inch block that's three inches tall, and then you shape it into a dragster. And so it's a hallmark product of Pitsco. It's very engaging for, for students to jump into. And we had about 40 students sign up, middle school, high school, and college to come in and compete. So they would book time to come into the garage area and they would work on their car and get it ready to go. And then they could practice racing it. And then in November, when we had our grand opening, we had a lot of dignitaries show up and we made sure to build cars for the dignitaries. So in this particular picture, we had the, uh, the mayor of Pittsburgh, Don McNay is present. Uh, and, and she was racing against a little bit of a uh, um, insider, I guess I should say, that's actually my son who she's racing against. And so, but we had a great time. We had a uh, university president, Dr. Steve Scott was present. And, oh, I see a note here that popped up. Somebody said they built a dragster back in 1984. There we go, that's great. So, but uh, we had university uh, uh, president, Steve Scott, uh, Dr. Scott was there and he ran against Pitsco president and founder, Dr. Harvey Dean. And they have a long working history together. And so it was great to see them compete and race their dragsters down the track. And then the 40 kids who had signed up had a chance to run through a bracket. And then we crowned a champion for fastest CO2 dragster at the Pitsco Idea Shop. Well, that was a, a great success. Everybody was excited about that. So then we said, all right, what are we gonna move to then in the spring? And so we just recently in the last couple of weeks completed our drone competition where students were able to come, in, come into the idea shop and actually design obstacle courses or field elements. And then they learned how to fly their drone through the field elements. And what, we, what they would do is then other teams would have to fly the other team's field obstacle courses. And so it was a matter of creativity, design work, design and engineering thinking, but then also the ability to pilot your drone. And so uh, those are the two competitions we've held at this point in time. And I don't know, uh, do we have some questions that we need to answer at this point, Jay? I see that some of them are popping up. I got um, one that um, was sent just to me. Um, I wanted to make sure we address, but um, it says Block 22 is amazing for the cross-functional collaboration and investments. Is there a timeline for the return on investment? It's kind of a three-parter. So timeline for return on investment, tips or lessons learned on making a, that collaboration work. And then if you transferred it to a larger city, if there's stuff that's generalizable about what you did. Got it. I'll, uh, I'll speak uh, to the return on investment question real quick. And then Jay, if, if you want to talk about, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I know you had a slide too about some of those lessons learned, but um, you know, and, I, and I'll, we'll say that the whole development. So separate out the idea shop piece. You know, we have some sense on, we're starting to get some sense how and how much money we'd have to bring in on membership standpoint and, and those sorts of things to make that operate. There's some interesting questions remain on that because just having had the first year in a pandemic, it's it's been challenging. But overall, as Jay talked about with the funding stack and and that those numbers are a little bit squishy in the sense that it's probably closer to 20 million. I know that with the university actually ended up raising about two, but that included all some of the FF and E and that kind of stuff on the inside. Um, we are honestly we're in a really solid position with regard to the long term financial success of this. You know, we're getting a 20 million dollar development. Uh, that is essentially, it's now uh, there's a leverage loan of $5 million, it's a traditional loan, because of all the tax credits, as well as the investment from the city and our private donors, that really shrunk that down that so now we're starting to get in talks with the developer about, uh, we can't go into a formal agreement for another, I think, I think we can't have a formal transfer of the property for another almost two years, just because of the tax credit provisions. But uh, we essentially went into this with the notion that we would do a 20 year lease at the end of which we would have the opportunity probably just to buy the purchase for a dollar. Uh, or if earlier we can get access to the transfer and we probably will because of how low interest rates are and, and we don't necessarily see them that changing is that much in the next 18 months, hopefully, but um, that we would actually get access to be able to do a contract to transfer the property over to the university. And then at that point, uh, we're we're paying in lease payments. Obviously, would then be paid back to ourselves. Uh, you know, all of the the tenants and that sort of thing. So honestly, if if we owned the property right now, if we we're we're just from the master lease approach, we're I think 
from an annual operating standpoint, you could say that we're in the black, I, you know, but there was obviously significant investment. If we were able to get ownership of the buildings, we would be making money technically uh, overall. And so uh, really just incredible approach that, that being able to get set to access those tax credits and also the investment from the city and those donors has been, has been huge. Jay, I don't know if you want to talk about the other question. Yeah, that's obviously, this is certainly a, a transferable project. It, it, it's not more, these projects are never more difficult than in smaller communities. Uh, in a larger community, it would certainly be easier to pull the funding in and to, and to see a return on investment probably quicker. Uh, I can tell you that from the city's sales tax has gone up every year since this has been, uh, substantially every year since this has been, this, this has been started. Um, you know, in terms of a, there's no question in, in, the, in the, the city's mind that the, it, was a, it was a sound investment of the city's fund. Uh, understand that these buildings were vacant, 100% empty uh, when, we, when, we, uh, when we took them, when, we took the, when they were re redeveloped. So they were generating nothing. Uh, and now they're, you know, they're, there's 100 students that live down there paying rent to the university, but to the major tenant. So yeah, there's, there's no question that this is a, a sound financial investment. Hey, Jay, I'll jump in here too on kind of the softer side of it and the fact that when we look at the, the three teams who were the finalists for our drone competition, they were Fredonia, Fort Scott, and Frontenac. They were teams all from outside city limits of Pittsburgh. And so one of the visions here was to obviously draw in all of Southeast Kansas. And so it's really putting, continuing to put Pittsburgh on the map in terms of the, the entire corner of the state in terms of showing what's, you know, what's going on and the progressive nature of what's occurring here in Pittsburgh. Yeah, and, and Matt and Jay are both, I think, pointing to something that, you know, I was probably getting a little bit too much into just the dollars and cents of the development itself. But I, I would say that if we think about ROI more broadly, which I would also say is, is when we talk about the notion of, of the, what's the essential foundation of this, it's, it's getting to a place where none of us are looking at this just from our own perspective, right? So it's not just the university, it's not just the city, it's you know, and I think that, so if we think about ROI, Matt's pointing to something which long-term could be that we have more students that want to go to Pittsburgh State because they've gotten their introduction to that, or they realize they can, they can explore those big dreams here in Southeast Kansas. They don't have to go somewhere else to do that. Those, those kind of softer ROI side of things will be important. It's obviously harder to quantify that, but that's really important. The fact in the 18 months after uh, Block 22 opened, so we opened in August of 2018 when the students moved in, the 18 months after that, we had almost 20 new, 20 new businesses open in downtown Pittsburgh. Uh, it's hard not to think that that's connected, right? That sense of momentum. Uh, and in fact, you know, I, I mentioned earlier about the success and the structure of our economy right now. We had, in October of 2019, we had five new restaurants open in downtown Pittsburgh, three at Block 22 and then uh, uh, two microbreweries. None of them closed during the pandemic. They all opened in October of 2019 and they're all still open now and thriving and you know i think that speaks again to the when we think about roi of these projects it's some of it is about that increased confidence that the people who live here have in it the increased confidence that people from the outside have to invest here and, and on and on so it's more than just these four buildings and then i think there's a question about lessons learned so oh yeah we'll, we'll talk about that a little bit um i think uh when we can talk a little bit about what we've learned we 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 really, the, the longer we spend working with each other, the more we understand what motivates and what drives each other. And, and looking at all of our, our relative, um, uh, you know, the demands on us, that what, what, our, what our goals are, uh, we really understand each other a lot better. And that, and that really helps us uh, move forward with projects together. And, and, to, and to, sometimes we move forward with projects that aren't necessarily a particular benefit to us, but we know that it's, it's important to them. So we do it anyway. Um, so and the idea here is, as I've said, we're, we're committing to that higher ideal, we're committing to that shared success, uh, and, and we are always uh, the first step along the way. If, 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 we're, if the first thing we think about is, okay, I, want, I, I got this initiative I'm thinking about, should I involve the university? You know, should I, what part of the business community should I engage with? So we, 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 we seek collaboration first. I mean, that the, we, don't, we aren't a big city, we don't have a ton of resources, we need all the resources we have in our community. Uh, and we need them to not be against each other and to, and to collaborate as much as possible. 
Um, the other thing that, that we, we definitely agreed to is that uh, you have, if you don't, you can, you can start collaborating, but unless you establish structures like our Joint City University Task Force that meet on a regular basis, where these people are structured, where you have a structure where people meet on a regular, regularly to discuss their issues, to discuss their problems, to look for solutions together, all right, you, you don't, it won't continue. It doesn't persist. So you have to really establish some organizational structures that allow you to continue with this successful collaboration that you've had. Um, of course, the I work for a city, so you know if you're not comfortable with conflict in a city, you, you're in the wrong business. But uh, but it, but the university some the universities are often not they're often not comfortable with conflict or at least have issues with that. And uh, and I think that uh, I mean one of the things that, that 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 I mean one of the things that you get with Dr. Nakarado is he, he's fearless, man. He'll jump right into something. So it's a it is an amazing. Uh, ability to, to be comfortable with that level of conflict and to face it and, and to address it uh, right up front. It really makes things a lot easier. Of course, a lot of that goes along with being able to, uh, to accommodate each other's needs, you know, when it comes to just meetings, when it comes to who you're t dealing with, giving, giving a little bit on your side to get something beneficial to everybody. All of that is, is, is true. Um, I, I do, and finally, I do have a, um, a sense, I think we all agree, we all have this sense here that no one's coming to our rescue here. I have a little saying on my on my whiteboard here that that, that no one's coming. We're on our own, and, and it is. And we, we can't expect anybody to happen. I know the federal government's going to rain money on us next year, but it, but it, it's but that, that we're not counting on that. It's not it's not part of what we do. We don't need it. So and so, yeah. something I will just tack on real quick to what Jay said there. I think each of those many of those things he's talking about, particularly when you think about the flexibility and the comfort and with conflict and and, and the collaboration, those kind of things. You also have to have deep commitment to that in your in the respective leaderships of the institutions. And so, uh, whether that's with the city of Pittsburgh or the private business that you're working with, or with the university. And I'll say, I want to give a shout out because Angela uh, and her team, and the, as I know that everybody uh, of my colleagues around the president's council table, at some point or another in the five years of this project, I made their lives more difficult <laughs> because, as Jay said, it might be that I'm fearless. <laughs> but sometimes it might just be that I'm not mindful enough of what it will be. So uh, I, uh, I'll say like the fact that we had, uh, whether it was Angela as C CIO or our general counsel or our C chief financial officer, all these folks that you can think about the amount of consternation this project has caused, their willingness to adapt and support it uh, has been exceptional. And so that's got to be a, a really significant highlight too. You can't have, particularly on the senior leadership teams, you can't have people that are trying to get in the way of, of these kinds of things or where it's not going to happen. One, one of the things I really quickly, this is an IT uh, conference. So I didn't want to talk about, about some of the things that we worked on IT wise. Um, the city uh, through, through its franchise agreements uh, arranged no uh, uh, co-location agreements with our local uh, cable providers and uh, our, our local fiber providers. And so we actually were able to make a connection between our, our network uh, shop, our network house and the university. And of course, Block 22 being over a mile away from the main campus, um, they needed a way to have connectivity there. And we were, we were able, because of what the city was able to do in our, our relationship, we were able to provide that level of connectivity to the university through our, through our facilities. And so uh, all, and all of that required a, a, a substantial amount of coordination between, between the city and the university. Uh, and, and, but it also resulted in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a, a reduced cost for the university. It's not cheap to, to put in a mile, mile and a quarter worth of conduit to, to house fiber. So we, uh, we just wanted to, and of course we have cameras all around that we, that we can feed directly to our police department around the, around the Block 22 development. All of that is coordinate, took coordination, took, uh, took cooperation agreements uh, across the board. Those are just some technical things that I think uh, that people need to be aware of. Are we done? Yeah, I think we were done. Sorry. <laughs> Any other questions out there? Yeah, I was going to say it's it's no big deal because we can go a little bit longer. But I I wasn't doing a good job of tracking the time because I was so into um, everything that you've been talking about about this project. And there's so many great um, messages in the chat. But if if we do want to take a few questions, we can definitely do that. I think the next session start around ten forty five. We should probably wrap up at the latest by, or sorry, 11.45, wrap up at the latest by 11.40.
we're here. Any, if you have any anything in the chat or any any questions, we can take them live right now. If you have any any questions, or ideas, or comments. By the way, I have to do a shout out to Canran. The city uses Canran for its as its internet provider or provider as well. So, uh, and I and and I can't tell you how much better it was than our other providers were <laughs> before it. So, it is a uh, it's an excellent uh, an excellent uh, uh, service that they provide. And I'll, uh, I'll put a plug in for a couple of things too. Uh, one is we're working, we're actually right now in talks and, and final, we haven't finalized this yet, but with um, the uh, Office of Rural Prosperity and the State Department of Commerce to actually host a uh, co-host with Department of Commerce and Office of Rural Opportunity, a conference here at Block 22, probably it's either gonna be August or early September. And it's gonna actually focus on um, focus on this very thing that we're talking about today, really. And in fact, uh, targeting universities. Uh, and I think we're, we're going to focus probably on regional university size kind of thing, but those communities and their, and their universities come here and basically we'll do a conference on case study on this. And then I think it's going to be with a, a challenge from commerce to say, who's next to do, to do this. And so uh, we're going to be pleased to do that. And then also I'll put a plug in for our, uh, our uh, podcast. It's called Around the Block. And you can get it on all the major podcasting sources. It was one of the great things to come out of the pandemic was the, having the time to actually start recording that it was something that uh, Brett Dalton and I had wanted to do for a while. Now that we're out of the pandemic, there's an open question of whether or not we'll have the time to keep it up, but uh, I'd love to have you guys check it out. Okay, so the question it looks like we have is, um, was there one big challenge? And then uh, who won the dragster competition with the mayor? Okay, so that's the most important question. Matt? I'm pretty sure we made sure that the mayor won. <laughs> <laughs> oh, is that what it was? Yeah, uh, that, was a, that was a fun thing. Uh, and I think Harvey beat Dr. Scott, right? Well, I, I, Dr. Scott beat him off the blocks the first time. Harvey's car didn't even go the first time. Oh, that's time. right. That's right. He had a malfunction. And then uh, Governor Kelly lost to the young woman. She yes. raised the, one of our, our students here. And then uh, and then I think our student also, a student also beat Secretary of Commerce, now Lieutenant Governor Tolan. So uh, it was a fun thing. As far as one big challenge, um, well, if, <laughs> I'll tell you the challenge that we got the most through all of this was where's everybody going to park? So like parking is always the, you know, the thing, which honestly uh, is not that big of a deal. And frankly, I've always, I always kind of joke back and people didn't necessarily like this, but I'm said, I hope there is a parking problem uh, because uh, that means that we're successful. We really probably have more problem with uh, walking than we do parking, but mm -hmm. um, you know, one big challenge, you know, it, I don't know. It's hard to, to, to make that, to, to get that narrow that down to one thing other than the parking, I guess, but Jay, what do you think? No, the, it's it, the putting the funding together. The funding is probably the thing. You know, it, it's not it is not a highly profitable uh, investment, and uh, and putting the funding together, you, it took a lot of work behind the scenes. The university helped with that. The city, you know, city cajoled when it where it could, uh, but it was it wasn't all just local people investing in it. It was investments from all over the country uh, from various investment groups. So, yeah, I'd say, I'd say financing, and then the second would be being figuring out how to navigate what is frankly not a system that is um, as supportive as it could be for public-private partnership. And I think that that is, uh, uh, I'll put it that way, I don't know how else to say it, but you know, there's, um, there are a lot of, of hurdles that probably we shouldn't have to be jumping over to get to a, 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 an end result like this. And the, and the trouble is a lot of those hurdles end up being the reason why people don't even try. And so, um, you know, I'm very supportive of the idea of us getting to a place where we're, we're thinking in terms of of, of facilitating more of this as opposed to the sort of safer approach that I think a lot of the, a lot of probably what you see in the statutory and regulatory side of things. Well, Sean, I'll jump in here as <clears throat> I came to Pitt State in 1991 as a student and have been here ever since. And uh, definite kudos to Sean and to Jay and other city officials who had the vision and the courage to jump out and, and take a risk like this, because that's, to me, that's, that's what makes this so powerful is that people who felt like, you know what, this is the right thing to do. We don't necessarily have every answer to get started, 
but we'll figure out the right answers along the way. And so that's, to me, makes me very proud to be uh, in the Pittsburgh community with that type of leadership. By the way, that's Dr. Scott in the bottom left-hand corner of this slide, by the way, flying a drone. So. Okay, well, we appreciate it. Doesn't look like we have any other questions for now, but um, I just want to thank you all for presenting. This has been a really, really great session to start off the conference with. Um, and uh, yeah, I just want to say we'll have the recording up on the Checks uh, YouTube site after the conference is over. So I think you had your contact information up there if, if anyone wanted to get a hold of you to talk more about the project. I'd be happy to. We appreciate the time and hope you guys have a great conference. All right, thank you. Awesome, thank you all. Okay, bye. <laughs> all right.